everyone. So our first presenter is going to be Megan Rearhout. Megan is a master's candidate in the medical sciences program at McMaster University in the lab of Dr. Shadow Ask. She received her Bachelor of Science degree at McMaster University as well in life sciences program. Megan's research interests include lung um, fibrosis disease, endoplasmic reticulum stress, and target in identification and disease. Thank you, Perry. Uh, so hello, everyone. I'm Megan. Um, I'm one of the TAs for this course. And I'm also a master's student in the lab of Dr. Ask. Um, so today, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about my research. Um, about my experience as a graduate student and about um, a research exchange that I did last month in China. Um, so this is a little bit repetitive, but like Perry said, I'm in the medical sciences program. Um, I research a disease called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or IPF, um, and this is done at the Firestone Institute for Respiratory Health. Um, so the Firestone Clinic, um, where respiratory patients are seen, is over at St. Joseph's Hospital in downtown Hamilton. So I'm a little bit back and forth between there and here at McMaster. Um, and like Perry said, I also did my undergrad here in life sciences. So I've been around for about seven years. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to give you guys a quick introduction into fibrotic lung disease, because I know the word idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis can be a little bit daunting. Um, so fibrotic lung disease involves progressive scarring of the lung. And this isn't normal scarring that occurs when, like when you get a cut on the skin. Um, it, is uh, a negative thing, makes the lungs hard, makes the uptake of oxygen very difficult, makes it hard for patients to breathe. And um, this is due to deposition of extracellular matrix, um, materials like collagen and fibronectin. Um, fibroproliferative disease is responsible for 45% of all mortalities worldwide. Now, this isn't just in the lung. Um, as you can see in the diagram here, it can occur in the kidney, in the liver. In the liver, it can manifest as cirrhosis. Um, I know people might be a little more familiar with the term cirrhosis than idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and yeah, one of the fibrotic lung diseases is IPF. Um, and idiopathic means of unknown cause. So we don't know why patients get this disease. Um, and unfortunately, there are very limited treatment options. There's nothing curative. There's things that can help extend life a little bit. Although, if patients get this disease, their median survival is only two and a half to three and a half years. Um, so what I study with regards to IPF is something called endoplasmic reticulum stress. So as you know, the endoplasmic reticulum is one of the organelles in our cells. Um, and endoplasmic reticulum stress, or ER stress, um, becomes activated when there's an accumulation of misfolded proteins in cells. Um, so mis protein misfolding can occur from many, many, many things. Um, there can be factors like allergens, cigarette smoke. Um, normal processes in the body can uh, trigger an accumulation of misfolded proteins. And that's when ER stress comes in. And when there's chronic ER stress, when it's not becoming resolved and the cell is just extremely stressed, something called the unfolded protein response, or the UPR, becomes active. Um, this is supposed to be a good thing. The unfolded protein response is supposed to um, make these proteins folded once again and solve the problem. However, in fibrotic disease, since it is chronically activated, it can lead to modulation of fibrotic processes, inflammation, and epithelial injury. So a little bit more into the UPR. So it has three arms. I won't go into too much detail because um, it can get a little bit meticulous. But the one I study, oh, sorry. So um, when the UPR is activated, translation is attenuated in the cell. So no more proteins are being made. The cell's already so stressed. Uh, we don't need more things introduced. Chaperone genes are upregulated to go and try to refold those misfolded proteins. And degradation genes are induced to try to get rid of all the misfolded proteins. So the pathway I study out of uh, the three is the IRE1-XBP1 pathway. Um, so simply put, it's just one of three pathways that, when become activated, um, uh, leads to the unfolded protein response. So, um, like I said, 
IPF is idiopathic. We don't know what causes it. We don't know what drives it, um, which is where target identification comes into play. If we target certain things in this disease, um, can it help resolve it? Can it make it less horrible? So uh, my research looks at the IRE1XBP1 pathway, one of three arms of the UPR, to see if modulating it can help resolve or make this disease better. Um, so I won't go into too much detail here either, it's kind of wordy, but essentially when this pathway is activated, um, something called spliced XBP1 is present. So this is full length XBP1, and when it becomes spliced, we lose 26 base pairs, and this is what signifies the activation of the pathway. So this is what I'm going and looking for, because I know when spliced XBP1 is there, this pathway is active. And then our lab looks at the UPR um, through the light of macrophages. So macrophages are a white blood cell, um, just a neutral macrophage here, M0. And then they can either be polarized into the M1 or M2 uh, state. So M1 is pro-inflammatory and M2 is pro-fibrotic. So we believe that these cells are going into the lung and um, causing more fibrosis you can see here. And uh, we've previously found that there's a link um, between the IRE1-XBP1 pathway and um, M2 macrophages. So in order for macrophages to become pro-fibrotic or the M2 phenotype, um, the IRE1-XBP1 pathway must be active. And what our lab has previously done was went in and blocked this pathway, and we found that macrophages were less pro-fibrotic when we did this. <coughs> Um, so my thesis overall um, characterizes the expression of spliced XBP1 or the signifier of the activation of this pathway in um, human disease. Um, I also look at mouse models as well. And um, not only do I look at lung tissue, but I also look in the blood of patients. So now I'm just going to quickly go through um, the methods that I use to look at uh, human lung tissue from IPF. Um, so first off, we um, went and we pulled out archived human lung tissues. So um, when a patient has this disease, or previously the standard protocol when a patient had this disease was to do a lung biopsy. Um, so surgeons go in, they take a piece of the lung, and then they can look at it further and study it there. Um, so the hospitals here in Hamilton had a huge library of um, these tissues from past patients that pathologists used, and we were lucky enough that we could get access to all of these that weren't being used anymore so we could further study the disease. <coughs> Then uh, we create something called a tissue microarray. Um, so what we do is we have all these blocks, but it takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, and a lot of money to study them one by one. So what we essentially have is something called a tissue microarray. It's like a giant hole puncher, essentially. And you can put many, many different samples into just one block and study it all together. Then we do histological assessments, so histology is the study of tissue, um, to simplify that word, and we do many different stains um, that look for different cells, looks for positivity, and it really helps us understand what cell types and what targets are present in these real examples of human disease. Um, from there, we digitalize the microscope slides that we get. Um, it just makes the process a lot easier. Instead of looking under a microscope and zooming in on certain sections, you just have a massive picture of this little piece of lung tissue. And then we have a quantitative tissue analysis software. So we go in and we quantify um, the cell types and the amount of positive staining so we can really get numbers for what's expressed in this human lung tissue. Um, so I'm just going to give you guys a few quick examples of some of the results I've gotten. So um, I found that spliced XBP1 is expressed in higher levels in um, IPF patients as compared to control. Um, so we did specific staining uh, for spliced XBP1 going after the um, messenger RNA. And then I also found that CD206, which is a marker for M2 macrophages, like I explained before, M2 profibrotic, we think they play a huge role in contributing to fibrosis, were up in um, the fibrotic human lung tissue as compared to controls as well. 
And then this here, this fancy picture, um, was uh, something called fluorescent in situ hybridization or FISH. Um, so what you're doing essentially is going in and you're fluorescently labeling the RNA um, of certain targets. So here we did staining for CCL18, a marker of M2 macrophages, and CD68. Uh, a marker that should be in all macrophages. And we found that they were co-localized in IPF, which just means that the macrophages in this human lung tissue were actually of the M2 phenotype, the profibrotic phenotype. So just summarizing my work that I've done on tissue thus far, so spliced XBP1, the signature of activation of the IRE1 pathway, is found at increased levels in fibrotic lung tissue from humans. CD206 or M2 macrophages is also elevated in fibrotic lung tissue from humans. And the co-localization of CCL18, an M2 macrophage marker, and CD68, a marker for all macrophages, confirms the ability of CCL18, uh, macrophages to produce CCL18 and IPF and thus be uh, profibrotic. Okay, so now I'm going to explain a little bit about my work in blood from IPF patients. Um, so basically, uh, what we believe is that there are cells called monocytes in the blood that are positive for a marker called CD14 um, that leave the circulation. So they're flowing through the body, and then something makes them enter the lung tissue. We're not quite sure what. But in the lung tissue, they differentiate into these M2 macrophages and contribute to fibrosis. Um, so I'm working on uh, three validation cohorts for this. So we've gotten patients here in Hamilton that I've already worked on, isolated these cells from their blood, and I'm now studying them. Um, down in Boston at the Brigham, Woman, Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, associated with Harvard, we also have these cells collected as well. And then um, last month I just got back from Guangzhou, China, and was doing the same thing over there. Um, so this is, these are just a few pictures from my exchange in China. Um, so I went over there um, with the protocol that I created here, and I taught um, the trainees there exactly how we do it here so we could produce comparable results. Um, luckily, they're still collecting and isolating and analyzing over there, too. Um, so we're hoping that with the establishment of both cohorts, um, we can have some pretty strong data. Um, so this is just me and the team. This was in the hospital. We were looking at CT scans of patients' lungs, um, just working at the bench, probably isolating RNA, um, working in the biological safety cabinet. Uh, I actually have patients' blood over here. This is just in front of the institute. So the detailed methods of what I do are um, we get blood samples from patients and controls. Um, we're very lucky to have such access to uh, patient samples here with the Firestone Institute of Respiratory Health. Like I said, there's also a patient clinic. Um, so samples get sent up from the clinic, and we have a really nice workflow. Um, and the whole lab participates in collecting these samples. They can come basically any day at any time, and we have seemed to be pretty good with that. Uh, from the blood, I isolate these cells. Um, essentially, I use a huge magnet that has a really strong field, and it helps pull away everything that is not these cells. I extract mRNA, or the genetic material, from these cells. Then I do something called mRNA sequencing, um, which helps us look for a signature, or something that's different in these cells compared to controls. Then we analyze it with bioinformatics, and um, we also collect plasma samples from these patients along with the CD14 positive monocytes so that we can confirm or compare um, the results that we've gotten from the genetic material with proteins in the plasma. Uh, so this is just a quick summary of sample collection thus far. So, so far we've gotten 78 samples in Canada, and when I was in Guangzhou, um, from July to August, I was able to collect 20, and we aim to reach 100 total. Like I said, they're still collecting and doing an excellent job over there. Um, so next steps for the blood project um, are to analyze the results I've gotten here with bioinformatic analysis and see if there's a genetic signature. Like what is so different about these cells 
um, in IPF patients, what makes them leave the blood and enter the lung and cause fibrosis compared to control patients or control subjects. Um, compare findings from the genetic material to plasma samples from these patients. And uh, when everything's ready, we can compare and contrast our findings between Hamilton, Boston, and Guangzhou. Um, okay, so now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and just talk about grad school in general. So who, who wants to do a master's in research? Raise your hand. Who wants to do medical school? Who wants to work? Who doesn't know? <laughs> that was like me too. Um, so with a master's in medical science research, um, it opens up the doors to a lot of different things. So a day in the life looks like many things. Every day is quite different. So you can be running experiments, tucked away in the lab, teaching. So um, a lot of uh, master's students are TAs um, for undergraduate courses, writing, whether it be papers, reports, um, presentations, like right now, travel, um, whether it be for research exchanges or to various conferences, and networking. So you get a lot of exposure to other people in the field, sometimes big names too, which is pretty cool. And with a master's in medical sciences, um, you can do many things. So the First option is to transfer to a PhD, do more school, um, professional school, medical school, dental school, etc. Enter the workforce, pharma industry, and more. And that's about it. Uh, I just want to say thank you to my wonderful lab mates. Um, without them, none of this would have been possible. Um, thank you to our lab technician, Spencer Revel, who basically runs that facility looking at tissue single-handedly and flawlessly. Um, Dr. Anmar Ayub, who is our clinical research associate and coordinated the delivery of all of these blood samples and tissue samples. The doctors at the Firestone Research Clinic, all the facilities here, the histology facility, the bioinformatics facility, um, that allow all of this to be a very well-oiled machine. So any questions? My email's down there. Ooh. Um, so in undergrad, sure. Um, so the question was, what made me interested in this research? Um, did I begin doing this in undergrad? Um, so in undergrad, I was actually in the co-op program in LifeSci, which gave me exposure to many different research environments. Um, I did gut health research. I did endometriosis research. Um, I worked with a neurosurgeon in Toronto to do clinical research. Um, and I just wanted to try something new. So I was exposed to research, and I knew I really liked research. However, um, I chose a completely different field for grad school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the question was, the CD14 positive cells, are they responding to the scarring in the lungs? Um, so we believe that they actually go into the lungs, differentiate into macrophages, and cause the scarring. Mm -hmm. um, is there any, I don't know if you consider like the validity of like clinical trials, but like is there any that could be, that you came across, or is that not a trial? Um, yes, there are many, many different ones. Um, in the RNA sequencing that I've done, uh, we've seen a lot of results that suggest that different cytokines and chemokines are playing a role. Um, however, this we need to look at these results a little bit more closely for me to have any definitive findings on what I've found. Yeah? Sure. So can I re-explain the three classes of macrophages? So this is my very uh, poorly drawn macrophage cartoon. Um, so M0, these are just neutral macrophages. Uh, we don't really know what they're causing. Um, they may not be causing anything. Um, M1 macrophages are pro-inflammatory. So when there's a type of uh, injury, um, these macrophages go in at first and um, recruit different parts of the immune system to start the healing process. And thus, there's inflammation. 
And then the M2 macrophages come in and they cause wound healing. They're going to heal it up. That's what helps cause these scars. But in IPF, we believe that they've kind of gone rogue and um, they're overhealing and causing fibrosis. Anything else?